Hello, and thank you for joining us for day three of the Apache Tomcat track. This morning, I'm, well, it's my morning, I guess. <laughs> I'll be presenting Getting Started Hacking Tomcat. And my expectation for anyone who attends this session or who would like to view it out, uh, after going through a handful of slides here, we should all be able to get the source code for Tomcat, build it, in, in its entirety, uh, and also um, navigate the code, find bugs, find enhancements that you might like to add, uh, add those enhancements, and submit patches or uh, pull requests or anything like that for Tomcat. So if you're interested and you're motivated, uh, feel free to um, not look at the slides uh, or um, to to minimize them in some way on your screen and kind of follow along and actually try to build. If you have issues building Tomcat uh, or following any of the instructions here, you're welcome to ask in the chat. Uh, there are a handful of Tomcat committers who are lurking here and I can also answer some questions uh, in real time. So um, please do so. Uh, the first question is, why in the world would you want to hack Tomcat? And by hacking, what I really mean is getting your hands dirty in the code. Instead of just downloading it, unzipping, or running the installer and using it, why might you like to actually... Um, whoops, I did not mean to do that on my screen. All right. Um, in, instead of just using it, you might want to get your hands dirty in the code, take a look around, see how things work, maybe break something. Um, maybe fix something. Um, academic researchers or home hobbyists might want to uh, look for security vulnerabilities. Uh, or maybe you have an idea for something that might be a vulnerability and you want to find out if it actually works. Uh, that might be easier if you understand the code that's going on or if you can attach a debugger or um, if you're not just treating it as a completely black box. Uh, and you can also help the Tomcat community, which um, I'll get to in a second. So in order to get started, you need a couple of dependencies. It may be obvious, but you'll need Java. You'll need a Java development kit uh, specifically. You can't use the runtime because you need the compiler and all those things. Um, you'll need a Git client for revision control. And for some parts of Tomcat, uh, you'll need the subversion client as well because we haven't migrated all of our repositories to Git yet. You'll also need Apache Ant, which is the build tool. You can get the Tomcat source as a single package, comes as a tarball or as a zip, uh, a zip package. Um, you can build the binaries just like we would do for a normal release. And you can build the documentation and the website as well. Um, very quickly, to get Git and Subversion, you can usually get those from your package manager if you're on a Linux distribution or anything that has a package manager. Um, for Windows, you can get those things from, um, I have Git SCM has binary downloads for you. Um, and I apologize, I didn't put a link in here for Subversion for a download, I don't think. Nope. Uh, for Windows users. So you might have to do a little bit of Googling for that. And uh, you'll also need Apache Ant, and you can get those binaries from the Apache website, or for rather from the Ant download site. The Tomcat source is pretty easy to get. You can either pull it out of GitHub um, use it by Git cloning that URL right there. You can also use the ASF's Gitbox repository, uh, which is a mirrored copy of GitHub. So everything goes back and forth. Um, so you can, you can pull from either of those. The documentation comes from Subversion, and that's the URL you'd need to use. So to fetch the Java sources for Tomcat, you would say git clone, and then this URL here for GitHub, for example. And to get the documentation, you would do um, SVN checkout and then give it that URL. You might want to 
uh, in both cases, rename those things because Tomcat might not be um, as specific as you'd like. So you might want to name that Tomcat 9 source or something to that effect. Um, be aware if you pull from GitHub using that address, you're going to pull all of the branches. So that includes 10, 9, 8, and 7. Um, if you just want to check out one branch, um, you'll need to, if, if you don't want to take up quite as much disk space, you can do that. Um, but what I found is that it doesn't actually save you very much. Uh, it's more typing than necessary, and you don't really save very much in terms of disk space. I have a quick script in my uh, in the same directory that this presentation is on. So I'll uh, jump way back to the beginning. The URL at the bottom of the screen, um, if you just chop off the file name at the end, there are all of my presentations for this year's Apache Con are in there, as well as a script. You can also snap the QR code if you want to take a look at that. But I have created a script called hurry.sh. Um, that won't work for Windows users, apologies. But it will grab all of the, the dependencies except for Git and Java. Um, because those are a little bit more complicated to install. Um, but it will grab uh, Apache Ant, and it will clone the master branch from GitHub for you. Let me just take a quick check. Mark has posted the links for subversion binaries. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, to build Tomcat, you will need four keys on your keyboard. They are the A key, the N key, and the T key followed by the enter or return key on your keyboard. That will build a working Tomcat into the directory you started in slash output slash build. Uh, depending on the speed of your machine, it might take a couple of minutes. Uh, I think on my machine, uh, a build with from clean usually takes something like 30 seconds. It's pretty quick. When you, if you want to start Tomcat, you need to change directory. You don't actually need to, but it might be more familiar to you to change directory to output build. That output build directory is what your Catalina home will be for this now built content, uh, this, this built server. And then you can run bin Catalina start or bin startup or whatever you prefer. Uh, those instructions are identical for Windows versus um, Unix systems, by the way. Um, it builds into the same place. Instead of running the sh file, you run the batch file instead. Let's see if anybody has replied to say that they can't get it built. Nobody yet. All right. I wonder if anybody's actually trying. <laughs> Maybe we'll get some questions later. So the documentation, as I mentioned, is in a different repository. That's in Subversion. That's how you can check it out. And be aware, this is big. It's more than a gigabyte of stuff. Uh, that's because it includes the documentation for all of the versions of Tomcat, including all of the user guide documentation for all of the branches and things like that. Uh, once you have waited for the download to finish, uh, if you just run ant in that directory you've checked out, it'll build all the documentation into the docs directory. It's, that's actually pretty quick because most of it's pre-built. Pre so let's see. A couple minutes in, and you've done everything you need to do. Now what do you do? Well, you could help us test a release build or just run the unit tests. Um, you could uh, you could make a change to Tomcat and run those unit tests to make sure you didn't break anything. Let's say you have some great idea for increasing performance of pipelined requests. Go in there, change it, run the unit tests. It's very easy. You type, oh, and I apologize. This is in the wrong font, but that's the command that you would run, ant test. And uh, it takes quite a while. Um, mostly because it's single threaded to uh, uh, by default. So on my computer that's about two years old, this takes about 25 minutes to run the entire test suite. 
uh, there are some settings that you might want to change. There's no build.properties, um, but there is a build.properties.default. And if you create your own build properties, it will override those properties that are in the default. And the ones that I'd highly recommend taking a look at are test.threads and just set it to something greater than one. Um, when I set it to eight on that same MacBook Pro, it reduces the test time from 25 minutes to about five. So it's pretty significant. But of course, as you raise the number of threads that are running the tests, you may take chunks of your machine away from yourself, you know, if you want to get some other work done at the same time. So I wouldn't ever recommend re raising the number of threads beyond the number of actual cores you have in your uh, in your machine because you're just going to create a thousand threads and they'll all be waiting for each other. The next three are all very similar to one another. It's execute.test. And then it's the name of the connector. So either the APR, the NIO, or the NIO2 connector. Most of the Tomcat tests do not care which connector they're run on. For example, testing a filter doesn't really matter whether you're using APR, NIO, or NIO2 to test that filter. However, it's actually a little bit easier for us to just run every test on every connector. So unless you specifically disable them, we will run most tests three times. If you just want to know if your non-connector related test is running, you can turn off the tests for two out of the three of the connectors and the whole test suite will take a lot less time to run. Once you've run the unit tests, you can find the logs in the output build directory um, under logs slash test, which is all in caps, dash, and then the full name of the class, including all of its dots and packages and things like that, followed by a dot, and then the IO type, which is either that APR or NIO or NIO2, dot text. If you want to run just one unit test, you would add this system property, which is test.entry, and set it equal to the full class name, including package, for the test that you'd like to run. For example, if you just want to test the remote IP valve, that's what you would type. The slash on the end here indicates to the shell that the command is being continued on the next line. So you, you don't need to add that slash there unless you actually want to have a new line in your uh, in your copy paste or whatever. So just in case nobody's, that's what that is. I'm going to, after every slide or so, I'm going to check back to the chat to see if anybody asked any question. I don't see any. For configuring logging, which is something that might be very interesting to do, especially while you're running the unit tests, um, the URL at the top will give you lots of information about how to do this, but the too long didn't read summary of that is edit conf slash logging properties and use logging style configuration that you would expect for the java.util.logging packages. Plus, uh, we do have some automatic replacement types of things uh, where Tomcat will create loggers of this form for each of your engines, hosts, and contexts. So if you're using the default engine and the default host, and you have a, uh, an application called My App, you can configure a logger, which is called all of this stuff dot Catalina dot localhost dot My App. And that will allow you to capture the logging information that's coming out of your application. Here's an example to grab all of the realm log, uh, uh, the logging from a, a realm for which you would use for authentication and authorization into a log file called realm.log. If you open up the logging.properties file, you'll see there's this handler log, uh, this handler line, which has actually quite a few things listed in it. You're welcome to replace that or leave it alone, but you can just add anything you want to the end of it. And this is the name of the logger. 
And then below, you can configure the logger by using log name dot and then a couple of different things. I've set the directory, which is to drop the log in Catalina base, which is where uh, where the uh, configuration for Tomcat is being run, slash logs. So it'll put it in the familiar log directory. The prefix is realm. So we'll end up with a realm.log. And I set the level, which is like the, uh, the filtering level or the logging level to finest, which should capture everything that comes out of that class. You also then need to tell the... Um, the logger for that class, this is this is setting the filter for the logging destination, the actual log file. This will set the log for the class and mention that you would like to turn up logging so that it logs everything. And then you need to specifically enable this logger's handlers, set that to realm.log, which refers to this. So up here, you're letting the subsystem know that you'd like to create a logger with that name. Here you configure the logger, and here you configure the classes that will log to that logger. So if you wanted to hack on the realm, for example, you could set up your configuration, your logging configuration in this way. And then instead of getting millions of lines of logging every time you do something in Tomcat, you can just look at the realm log. If you'd like to send your applications logs to app.log, it's very similar, except here I'm using the default engine and the default um, host. And then and my app is called my app. And then I set the handlers equal to app log. And I've configured app log to be in this directory. Oops, I forgot to put uh, slash logs at the end of that, but really you can put it anywhere. And then my prefix is app, so I'll get log files named appdoc.log, and then my app needs to log to this handler at the finest or the highest logging level. Other useful settings for the build include the base path. Um, the base path will, uh, will tell, let's see, you know what, I've completely blanked on what the base path is. Someone will type that into the chat and then I'll announce it to everyone in a second. You can disable the validator. The validator runs check style, which we do for releases to make sure that uh, we haven't put anything into text files that aren't supposed to be there. It makes sure that the, um, that the ASF uh, prelude or um, um, preamble is at the top of every file that it makes sense to, to load. Uh, and that can take some time. So if you just want to do a quick build to find out if it's compiling, or if you want to run the unit tests or something that you don't want to take very long, you can simply skip the validation step. And that's one way to do it. You might also want to um, set the uh, location for OpenSSL. A lot of the newer versions of Tomcat can take advantage of OpenSSL features that may be in a version that's maybe later than the one that your operating system comes bundled with. For example, um, I think my operating system that I use daily contains an OpenSSL version, which I think is based on 1.0.1. .1. But if I'd like to use 1.1 .1 or 1.2 and try out the new um, uh, the new TLS uh, 3 versions that are available in there, uh, you need to override the path that points to your OpenSSL library. And this is how you would do that kind of thing. I happen to be using Brew on, uh, on Mac OS. And for example, this is where Brew locates its binaries for OpenSSL. Oh yes, thank you, Violetta. She says the base path is where the, is where the, um, the dependent libraries are downloaded to. For example, uh, Tomcat needs to execute check style, so it's going to download check style. Tomcat needs to uh, to download um, uh, the installer builder for Windows and things like that. So that is the location where it will put those. This is especially useful if you have multiple 
uh, multiple copies of the Tomcat source in different places. For example, if you had separate directories for the 9.0, the 8.5, and the 10.0 source releases, you might want to share a base path between all three of them so that you're not downloading check style three, three different times at a time. Back to OpenSSL, you might like to tell the tests that your version of OpenSSL doesn't have, for example, the ARIA suite of cryptographic primitives or the GOST suite. And that will uh, reduce the number of test failures that you experience just because of environmental settings. You might want to disable those to, to ignore them. Mark points out other dependencies are JUnit, the, um, the Eclipse compiler for Java, and uh, the BND thing, which is a kind of hand wavy thing that I don't understand that has something to do with OSGI. <laughs> so not everybody wants to use VI or Emacs. So how would you configure Tomcat to work in your IDE, such as Eclipse or IntelliJ or NetBeans? Well, it turns out that we've made that very easy for you. If you check out the Tomcat source directory and then you run ant IDE Eclipse or IDE dash IntelliJ or IDE dash NetBeans, Tomcat's build script will generate all the files that are necessary for that particular IDE to use that directory as a project directory. So if you wanted to, you could check out the source, run one of those three build targets, and then import that directory into your IDE as, as a working project, and it would inherit all of that information. Let me check and see if there are any other comments. Yes, ant IDE is cool. <laughs> OK. Um, I have had difficulty trying to launch. Let's not say difficulty. I find it awkward and hand wavy and a little bit mystifying as to where things go and how things run when I actually try to launch Tomcat from within Eclipse. Now, maybe that's an Eclipse problem. Maybe that's a me problem. But uh, I typically like to run my Tomcats and my applications in one place and then use the IDE more of a text editor than anything else. Um, but you can start up Tomcat in remote debugging mode and then connect to it from your IDE, which sounds like it is uh, more complicated, but I find it more straightforward personally. So all you have to do is when you launch Tomcat, instead of just using the start verb, you'd say JPDA start, and that allows the JVM to start up in a way that is receptive to attaching a debugger. So once you've done that, you can attach your IT, your IDE to that JDPA port, uh, which is 8,000. And the way that you would do that in Eclipse, and I'm sorry, I don't have instructions for those using others because Eclipse is the, is the IDE that I happen to use. Um, you'd go to the run menu and under debug configurations, you want to choose a remote Java application. And for me, I had to scroll around because it's there are so many different types of debug configurations. You have to scroll off the bottom of the window and then create a new one. You tell it that you would like to debug a project uh, or that it's a, a remote job applications for a project. And then you just set the connection information. And I believe it already defaults to localhost 8000. So with like three clicks, you can connect to a running Tomcat and it knows which project uh, or you need to choose the project, excuse me. Uh, once you've chosen the project which represents uh, Tomcat, once it connects, you can actually go in there and then set breakpoints and modify the code and uh, inspect things as they're running. And you can you can use it like a like you would expect a debugger under sort of a regular application. Oh, I already covered that. So uh, you can you can do all that stepping and, and live edit of codes that. Uh, that you've come to expect from good debuggers. If you're interested in using TC Native, um, it's actually not that difficult to do. TC Native provides Tomcat with the ability to use the OpenSSL cryptographic library. 
And you will need TC native whether you're using the APR connector or not. So if you want to use OpenSSL, you're required to use TC native at this point. Um, the APR connector gives you two things. It gives you access to the OpenSSL cryptographic library, but it also gives you access, or maybe not access to, but it uh, implements an IO strategy which uses the same IO library that uh, that Apache HTTP is using for um, for polling, for stream and channel management, and things of that nature. If you use the NIO2 or NIO libraries, uh, excuse me, connectors in Tomcat, you can still use the OpenSSL cryptographic library, which still appears to have, for various reasons, uh, significant performance improvements over what's available through the Java cryptographic provider. Um, and in either case, you'll need TC native. Uh, as the name suggests, TC native is native code. It's not Java. There are a few Java classes that, um, that are all implemented in native code. And those things are found in the Tomcat source tree. Um, but the rest of TC native is all, um, is all C code. So to fetch from the repo, you can get clone that URL. Uh, building's pretty easy conceptually. You just run configure and make like you would with many, many uh, source projects. Sometimes it's a little tricky to figure out exactly on your platform what you need to fill in in each of these ellipses here with APR, with SSL, and with Java Home. So that's going to be very environmentally dependent. If you're running on Unix or, or Linux or something similar, you probably have APR and your and SSL in the form of OpenSSL already installed. Um, you might need to hunt around for this a little bit, and that might be in a location which is sort of hard for me to predict because it depends on whether or not you're on CentOS or uh, RHEL or Debian or Ubuntu or anything like that. Uh, I would recommend setting the exact prefix to none. Uh, that way it won't try to uh, do anything strange like set up a local directory which includes a whole deployment. Um, you just end up with the uh, the DLLs or the shared library, actually not DLLs in this case, but for you know, just give you the shared libraries in, in one location and then you can put them wherever you want to put them. Speaking of where to put them, the binaries are uh, found in tomcatnative.libs, which uh, sometimes may be difficult to find because uh, ls usually doesn't show directories that start with dots. So you might be surprised to find that you can't find what you're looking for. It's in the .libs directory after the build, and you'll want to copy those into the Catalina home slash lib directory. You'll want to make sure that you have the APR lifecycle listener enabled. And by the way, that is the default, and that will give you access to both the APR connector and JSSE plus OpenSSL. Let me do a quick check for questions. A little chat, but I don't see any questions. Felix points out that uh, when you use JPDA start, there are a host of options that you can choose for configuring, for example, the port number, and there's probably some authentication things in there. There's a bunch of other things that you can do. If you're just running on your own computer and you're, uh, you're sort of all alone, then probably the defaults are going to work fine for you. If you're interested in submitting a patch or a pull request to the Tomcat team, there are lots of ways to do that. Um, one of the most convenient ways for a lot of folks is to uh, give us a pull request on GitHub. So if you fork the Tomcat project and you uh, you commit and push to your own repository, you can send a pull request to GitHub very, uh, via GitHub to Tomcat very easily. Uh, allows us to review the code and, uh, and apply your patch or your pull request. You can also create an issue in, uh, in Bugzilla. That's fine for both enhancements and fixes. Um, just attach your patch to the Bugzilla issue and, um, and we'll see how it goes. Definitely, definitely don't email a committer directly. There are some committers that uh, that are far more active than others, 
And uh, while it may be very tempting to reach out to an individual committer and say, would you please apply my patch? Um, that's not likely to get a good response. Um, if you go through the normal channels, which would be to you do to submit a pull request via GitHub or to a patch through Bugzilla, um, you might get that same person who addresses your patch, but they're going to be much more happy about doing it through the normal channels than if you were to submit it via email to them directly. Smaller patches are better patches. If you send a patch that has five line change and it's got a comment and it's easy to read and it's easy to demonstrate that it's a good idea, that will probably get merged within a few tens of hours of you submitting that patch. If you submit a patch that has 12 files with, uh, with 5,000 lines of code change, it's going to be much more difficult for someone to review that patch and determine really what's changed and, uh, and tested and things like that. If you are doing something that's complicated, because sometimes patches just need to be complicated, if you can submit a series of patches where there's a preparation patch which doesn't really change anything, and then there's the patch which includes the changes, and then maybe there's some cleanup after the fact, and split those into separate things, that would be wonderful. Uh, that's very easy to do using GitHub or using Git because you can you can commit early and commit often, and then we can see the changes that occurred in each commit, and they each have their own separate uh, descriptions of what they are. If you are submitting your patch via Bugzilla, you can do the exact same thing. You just have to produce different patch files and send them as uh, and attach them as separate attachments in the Bugzilla issue. Code comments are very helpful. Please explain what you are doing. That's very helpful, not just to the person who's applying the patch, but anybody who might come along months later and try to figure out what's going on in your code. Also, please respect the coding conventions. The current coding conventions uh, you can find uh, somewhere on the Tomcat site. And uh, I have to admit that they do not necessarily represent 100% of the code that's currently in Tomcat. So at some point, we decided to put the curly braces in one place versus another. And no, we didn't go back and change every single file uh, because that's kind of useless to do. However, moving forward, uh, please make sure that you take a quick look at the coding conventions and adhere to them as well as you can. Earlier, I mentioned that you can disable check style. If you're going to produce a patch and send it into the Tomcat team, please re-enable check style and run it one more time before you send in your patch. It should generally catch every single one of those issues and let you know before you do that. Uh, I personally always forget to do that. And somebody else, 10 minutes after I do a commit, always goes in and says, make check style happy. And I apologize retrospectively and in advance to everyone who ever does that for me. So thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, since Mark mentioned in the chat, please don't put your name into a Java source file as an author using the Java doc tags. I know it's very tempting uh, if you're submitting a patch, technically you are an author. Yes, I know there are author tags in there already. Uh, and why should they be in there and not you? Uh, I can't really give you a good answer for why they're still in there. Frankly, I think we should probably purge them, but they're in there for historical reasons. If you send us a patch, you will be credited uh, uh, as much as we can. You'll get your name in the change log. You'll get your name generally in the um, uh, in the commit log. And also when we put out new releases of Tomcat and we mentioned the major features, if if you've submitted something that, that is sort of worthy of mention, your name will go in that release announcement as well. So thank you very much. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe all the author tags are gone. OK. Um, so how can you help? Well, you can help test release candidates. If you look for the vote threads on the dev at mailing list for Tomcat, um, you can just search for the word vote. And if you add brackets around it, sometimes it 
takes a little bit of the cruft out of there as well. You can find uh, you can find all of the votes in the past, frankly, but um, if you're subscribed to the mailing list, uh, you'll see those come up roughly in real time. And um, with the exception of Tomcat 7, we usually have one release, about one release per month. And that those releases generally start getting organized during the first few days. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if, let's say, Monday, somebody were to propose that we do another release of Tomcat 10 and 9 and 8.5. And once there's sort of support for doing that, uh, the release manager will prepare a release, post it in a number of locations, and then put a message out on the dev list saying, please go ahead and test. Now, only members of the project management committee have what are called binding votes, which means that um, you need to get enough of us to say yes to the release and there need to be more yeses than nos uh, but if you help us if you say yes that gives us further confidence that the release is good and if you say no uh, that's important information for us to have maybe you have some configuration that none of us have uh, maybe you have a web application that exercises part of tomcat that's not covered by the unit tests Maybe it's not necessarily a problem uh, in terms of, you know, something isn't working, but maybe it's something like performance. Ah, I've noticed that with the recent patch to fix something that the throughput of the HTTP2 connector has just been cut in half. Can you please look at that? We will take a look. Uh, it doesn't matter what your, uh, what your level of involvement is with the project, if you, if you reply to a release vote and say, I think I found a problem, we'll take it seriously and we'll look at it. I also like to remind people who uh, meet me and they say, oh, you know, you're a Tomcat committer. That's great. Uh, I say, you know, you can do this too. <laughs> Nothing's stopping you. Um, but it's always surprising to me to find out how few votes can literally affect the entire world. I would say that of the release votes that have happened in the recent past, you know, last year or two, the average total number of votes is about four on every on any given release. So that means that only four humans in the whole, in the whole world raised their hands and said, yes, this release is good. And it flows downstream to a lot of different places. There are a lot of places that will just uh, apply whatever uh, whatever comes through their package manager. And if the package manager has an update, then they'll send out the update. Uh, or um, if you're building a new version of your product, then you might want to uh, include the latest re release of Tomcat. Um, Tomcat releases, generally speaking, end up being so, uh, so stable that even even I sometimes uh, don't think about testing them before I just go ahead and put them right onto a server that other people are going to use. Maybe not necessarily production, but definitely right into QA. And so if we can get more members of the community to help us um, to help us test, that would be that would be very helpful. And I think I'm actually at time. So let me just quickly check. You can report bugs through Bugzilla and through GitHub. Um, reporting security bugs goes to that mailing list. Please don't put those in Bugzilla or in GitHub. And if you're interested in security, please, in about 40 minutes, join us for our uh, uh, roundtable discussion here in the Tomcat track about security. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons why you might want to help. Uh, we would love to have your help. And uh, if you help us a lot, you uh, will certainly get an invitation to become a committer. I think we've had uh, over the past few months, two more committers who just had an itch that they really wanted to scratch. And uh, once they started working, they got sucked into the whole thing. And um, uh, these features here were all added by members of the community in the very recent past. These didn't come from from members of the Tomcat team that came from outside. 
Uh, I don't actually have any time for any questions, but if you'd like to join us, uh, as, as I said, um, in the uh, in the Tomcat BOF, the Birds of a Feather, that will be open after the third session, and uh, the hallway track um, will also be available. So thank you very much for your time.